I know of no subject that is more corrupted among those who claim to be believers in God and his Christ and the scriptures as the word of God than the subject of salvation by grace. The basic idea that's set out in the scriptures concerning grace. The question I would have foremost in our minds in our lesson this morning is, are you, am I, is anyone taught by grace? Are you taught by grace? Holding that question out before us, I would like to look at Paul's writing to the preacher Titus in Titus 2, verses 11 and 12. Titus 2, 11 and 12. And that will you, we will use that verse as our scripture to begin this study and the answer to our question, Are you taught by grace? For the grace of God hath appeared. Bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to the intent that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world or age, Titus 2, 11 and 12, as I said. I'd like to begin at the end of it, a few preliminaries, the end of this, these two verses, <clears throat> and note that he's talking about what goes on in service to God in this present world. Well, one thing about this that makes it clear that it's in this present age or world that we have the opportunity to be saved from our sins. And as the church, to continue to live, live the gospel and preach the gospel to every creature, being that the gospel is God's power to save men, Romans 1, verse 16. So what he has to say here pertains to this present age. Let's keep that in mind. So this grace of God, what is it? It is the unmerited, undeserved favor of God regarding man being saved from his sins and a way made for him to go to heaven. Of course, the greatest manifestations of this favor are seen in the life and the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for our sins. So our sins, our transgressions of God's law could be forgiven, 1 John 3, 4. And it is the Bible that tells us all we know concerning God's will for us. So even when we can deduce certain things concerning deity from natural creation, it is only in special revelation from God to man that is going to tell us about salvation, how to live as God wants us to live. It tells us about the work of Jesus on our behalf, something none of us could do. It tells us about his love in coming to the earth and God's love in sending him, John 3, 16. The message of love telling us how to be saved from our sins. And once saved from our alien sins, the sins that originally separated us from God, Romans 3, 23, Romans 6, 23. A great message of love on how we live in the body of Christ, the Lord's church, as family members. How we are to be faithful to him. And though I've repeated it often, I'll repeat it again. Most of the New Testament is written to those who are saved from their past sins. Concerning 
how they live faithful Christian lives. So I simply ask in view of Paul's writing to the preacher Timothy, or rather Titus, what he needed to know for himself as well as what he needed to preach to those who would hear him, are we taught by the grace of God? Well, I notice the grace of God hath appeared. That's past tense. And Paul wrote this, the grace, the favor of God that no man can merit, that no man can deserve, has appeared. That's Christ. He had his earthly ministry. It ended with his suffering and death on the cross and his resurrection and leaving to go back to heaven. So he brought salvation to all men, but notice teaching us or instructing us. Let's keep that in mind. Grace came teaching. The unmerited favor of God that we don't deserve in the form of Jesus Christ who declared he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14 and verse 6, came teaching. And you can see that teaching and understand that teaching in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as far as what he did in his earthly ministry. This grace, seeing that Titus is a Christian and he's to be teaching this, two people are outside of Christ as well as in Christ. This grace teaches us what we as children of God, partakers of God's favor, through belief and obedience to the gospel, God's power to save us. It teaches us what we have renounced. I think one of the worst doctrines around is a doctrine that says you don't really have to renounce anything to become a Christian. You don't have to give up anything. There's no sacrifice involved on your part. You just acknowledge that you're a sinner and ask Christ to save you. I had a call. I kept it on our answering machine from some church in this area that was telling me that God loved me of course, this is a message evidently they put out to everybody, a recorded message. And it was simply pray the sinner's prayer, as it's called among denominational people, and you'll be saved. His statement to me was, if I would acknowledge I was lost and would ask Jesus to save me, that's all that it took. That's the general idea of the false doctrines that float around concerning grace. Notice the word denying. Did you notice that? Denying is present tense. But when you look at the Greek language, you'll see Paul used what's called an aorist participle. Having denied. And having renounced. Now, it's interesting. Present tense is that it just keeps on going in the Greek language. It's described as linear action. You just draw a straight line. But the aorist tense is one-time action. And you describe it with a period, punctiliar action. And that doesn't mean when it happens once, it doesn't affect you on down the line. It's interesting that the Holy Spirit had Paul use this kind of grammar. And the Aries tense suggests that this is a once for all thing that you did when you obeyed the gospel of Christ. That's what conversion is. You changed. You died to the purposeful practice of sin when you repented of your sin. You resolved at that point that from here on out, whatever the Lord wants me to do, I'm going to do it. Whatever he wants me to give up, I'm going to give it up. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life studying the Bible to learn what I ought to do and ought not do. So the Aristotle's uh, tense suggests that this denial is that 
once and for all thing. That we never intend to practice such things again as long as we live. And that's the idea. That's the reason we bring lessons from time to time, maybe not as much as we ought to, on the importance of repentance and the plan of salvation and just exactly what repentance is. Because I fear greatly that even in the church, many people think it's just say, well, I feel bad about it, it's wrong, I see it's wrong, I'm so sorry, but there's no correction made in their life. There's no fruit of repentance that proves they have resolved in their heart of hearts that no longer will I commit this sin. So while repentance involves saying, I'm sorry toward God, repentance means I'm ready to change whoever I see the Lord wants me to. Now when a person obeys the gospel according to what Bible knowledge they have at that point, then they may not know in the future what they will discover in their lives that they'll need to augment, change, or incorporate into them to continue to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But the resolve is there. You made that determination. You made that determination based upon evidence. The evidence that Christ is the Son of God. That the Word of God is our guide. And so you continue to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. And so a person who's been a member of the church at a very early age, now as an older person, still possession of his faculties, still peers and studies into the Bible and seeks to keep one's life in harmony with what he's learned, as well as teach it to others. You'll notice that he says, first of all, we have denied in our lives ungodliness. Ungodliness. This word carries with it the idea or suggests to us impiety, irreverence, and disrespect for God. If you look around about you today, it's always been here, but it grows more today. Impiety is all around us. Irreverence is all around us. And lack of respect for God because he is God and all that that implies is around us every day. Now we as the church should have renounced all of that. And we don't take these matters lightly, but we are sober in our thinking about them. We're serious in thinking about it. And we don't fall back into that kind of trap. And we need to understand that's just a part of being converted. It's just the way that it works. I would focus in on the idea of repentance connection to being converted. If there's been no genuine repentance, there's not going to be any conversion. Since this attitude or state of mind, that is this impiety, this irreverence, this disrespect for God since this is manifested in just general disobedience to God because it doesn't care about God if you have that attitude that mindset you don't care about God your mind's on other things that doesn't mean that the other things are all terrible it's just this present world governs you what goes on in the flesh interests you there's no fault about another way of living, another viewpoint. So the word is used for such sins as make us really unlike God. I think a lot of folks have missed out on the fact of repentance and the conversion process means we begin a trip that says I'm going to make myself like God. And I'm going to choose those things that help me become like God, and I'm going to turn from those things that don't. So when people refuse to follow the example of Jesus, remember, He's God in the flesh. 
and practice things which make them unlike Jesus and attitude and outlook on life, the design and purpose of this world, and that I'm here to serve God. Then what are they? They're ungodly. I think we have to watch out lest we think of ungodly as somebody that's uh, uh, in China or Russia or somewhere like that. There's an outright atheist. No, you can be unlike God and say, I believe in God and I believe in Christ and I believe in the Bible. You just haven't understood that life in the flesh as a member of the church is incorporating those things of the Bible into your life that makes you like God, thought, word, and action. So we've renounced ungodliness if we're faithful Christians, if we've truly been converted. The next is, is that we have renounced worldly lusts. We have renounced worldly lust. The word lust is used almost always to mean an evil desire. It means to gratify your human appetites, even if it means violating the Lord's will. A person wants to be married, but doesn't want to abide by the teachings of God on who is eligible for marriage. They just go out here and get married any way they want to, and they don't think anything about it. They don't think you should question them or point them out or point out to them that they're wrong. And you can go on and just take that as a major point on how people do this, and you can see it in so many ways. An evil desire, a desire that allows you to satisfy the appetites of the flesh contrary and against the will of God. Now, the interesting thing is that the word that Paul used can mean simple desire. And so he used the word worldly along with it to indicate that the desires we have renounced are evil. After all, God made us in this fleshly body. He made this world for us to live in. It's fitted for this world. There has to be natural desires in it or you couldn't function right. But then the Word of God governs us and regulates those desires. So Paul wants to make sure I'm talking about satisfying human desires to the point, or if need be, to the violation of God's will. So these worldly desires spring out of what we would call filthy, foolish manner of life, uh, conversation, words, thoughts, evil deeds. So we have made this comment back in the Old Testament to guide us in this area, as there are many other places, but Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. Guard thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Where I set my heart, I allow my heart to be set on whatever it's going to be set on. But I guide my heart the way the Bible says it ought to go. So it comes down to choose you this day whom you will serve. The choosing power is in the heart. So this renunciation of ungodliness and worldly lust is what Paul calls death to sin in Romans chapter 6. We die to sin. We've renounced ungodliness and worldly lust because we're converted to Christ. We now follow His teaching. And as I say again, we don't know many times, especially the younger we are, when we obey the gospel, where all that's going to lead us. But we've already concluded from the scriptures that God's not going to lead us in a bad way. He's going to lead us in pathways of righteousness for his namesake. His path, the straight and narrow way, is the path that leads to heaven and no other. Now in Romans 6, he tells us that when we were baptized into Christ, we were baptized into his death. What does that mean? Death means separation. Death to sin. We no longer practice sin. We don't just go out here and do as we please and never think about what God says. We're working all the time to try to see life as God says we should. 
And this means that our relationship to sin was actually terminated when we were baptized in the death of Christ, Romans 6, 3 and 4. So since we have died to sin at repentance, then we do not let sin rule or reign in our mortal body to obey the lust thereof. Well, you see the growth process. That the will is directly involved. How do I live like the Bible says? I must do what the Bible says. I often say this to make sure that we understand complete obedience to a commandment is necessary. Doing what God said do in the way God said do it and for the reason. Sometimes it gives us more than one reason that we're to do it. That's part of examining myself to see whether I'm in the faith. Is to say, have I completely obeyed? what the Lord said. There's a host of people that think they're children of God who have believed in Christ. They may have said in their mind, I'm truly repented, but yet they have not done what the Lord said to do to get remission of sins. But what teaches, the same scripture that teaches belief and how it comes and what it is, and repentance and what it is, and so on, teaches the truth on baptism. So we're not to keep our members, our fleshly bodies, as servants or instruments of unrighteousness. It's right the opposite. We are once for all. That's the idea. Once for all to present our members as instruments of righteousness. I won't read those now, but just notice Romans 6, 11 through 13. And that's the very point. Now remember, remember, Paul wrote this letter to Christians. He did not have to explain to them, because they didn't know it, the plan of salvation. They knew it. When you read Romans 6, they knew that exactly. Maybe they didn't get the implications of it. What do I mean by that? That if you're genuinely converted, then you die to sin. Colossians 3, verses 9 and 10, Paul speaks of this. Ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Now think of that in the light of what we've been saying. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So you see, that is a description of the converted person. The person who is a Christian the person who has genuinely believed and repented of sins. Then we notice God teaches us sobriety. Now this word soberly comes from a Koine Greek word which suggests the exercise of that restraint that governs all of our passions and all of our desires. And thereby the believer is enabled to be conformed to the mind of Christ. Now that comes from Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. But you see this taught by Paul to the Philippian brethren, Philippians 2.5. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So in this word, grace teaches us what? Remember, our question is, grace, does grace teach us anything? Well, in this word, grace is teaching us that we're to continue. It's a lifelong process. We're to continue to deny ourselves ungodliness and worldly lust. It's an ongoing thing. What you denied when you obeyed the gospel, as far as ungodliness and worldly lust, you continue to do so. You don't know where all that's going to take you when you become a Christian. You don't know what all that's going to do when it comes to what you do, how you face certain situations, wherever you are. We're to love the things Jesus loved. We're to hate the things that Jesus hated. We're to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, 1 John 2, 15. You see how all these scriptures are basically talking about the same thing? 
We're to love God with our whole heart and mind and strength. And we're to love our fellow man as ourselves. Do you know how to love yourself? Do you know what godly love for yourself is? We could spend a long, long time on answering the question, how do I know how to look at myself in the sense of loving myself? If I don't have that straight, how can I love my neighbor as myself? If we love God, there's one thing for sure. It is seen in our obedience to the will of God. John 14, 15 and 1 John 5, verse 3. If we love our neighbor, we'll do him no ill, as the Bible would define ill, and we'll only practice good toward him, as the Bible defines that good. We will be his servant, as it were. Romans 13, 10, and the Lord's teaching, on he that would be greatest among you, let him be your servant. Grace teaches us to live righteous lives. When the words righteously and godly are used together, the word righteously has reference to our treatment of our fellow man. Then the word godly has reference to our treatment of God. Paul tells us by inspiration, be tenderly affectioned one to another. Then he goes ahead to say, communicating to the necessities of the saints. He also goes ahead to say, render to no man evil for evil. He says, be at peace with all men, if possible. Then let us not judge one another anymore that we may not put a stumbling block in our brother's way. Now we need to go into a full study of what a stumbling block is biblically. But it means in those areas where I have liberty, I'm mindful that I may have understandings here that somebody else, a new member of the church, may not have. And I've got to be careful of how I live before him lest he misconstrue things. Because when you put a stumbling block in your brother's way, you destroy him. And we're told not to do that. Because Christ died for him too, Romans 12, 10 through 18, and chapter 14 and verse 13. There is that concern for others. That's the point I want to make here in loving your neighbors yourself. Then Paul wrote to the Ephesians, putting away lying, speak every man truth and watch it with his neighbor. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing that is good. And when he said good, he means as the Bible defines good. A lot of folks working their hands that which is not good. And it says that's the case because in doing so, he will have to give to him that needeth. I wonder how many people in the church today Think about getting a job with the idea that I will have money to give to others. Then he says concerning our personal dealings that all bitterness and wrath and anger, clamor, uh, all evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. But let fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you, nor filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which is not fitting. You don't let anything that the world thinks, nothing about it all, taint you. Now you're not going to understand some of these things that I just read. As to the details of them in your own life, till you spend time studying the scriptures regarding these matters. Those people at that time didn't, and we won't either. The thing about it is he wrote these to Christians, so it means Christians can fall into these traps 
which means we can go right back into the way the world views things, at least to some extent. Grace teaches us, communicates to us, what godliness is. If I were to ask you now to write down on a sheet of paper one word, what is godliness? What would you write? What is the meaning of godliness? Because we're to be godly. Godliness is simply this. Godlikeness. So that causes me to ask the question as a member of the church Christian, am I like God? So the word is truly talking about genuine piousness on our part, not a fake thing. That we are reverent in our worship of God and in our communion with God. Remember our study last week, Psalm 111 and verse 9, holy and reverend is his name. And it's imperative. You can't get around it and be what God wants you to be for us to recognize and remember our weaknesses and sinfulness in contrast with God's flawless, that is, perfect holiness. And that when we come together in this assembly, we should be doing our best as it's an assembly of worship to set these things aside that's going to cause us to have our minds where they shouldn't be. Because we're mindful of His flawless holiness. And we're coming into His presence in a special way when we assemble as we are here today. So there should be respect on our part. There should be humility on our part. There should be that reverence of God. Think about it. If we were, if we were called before the supreme judge of the land, then we would realize that our welfare for several years is in his hands. I think we would show him the greatest possible respect. How much more so when it comes to children of God. And how we should realize everything physical and spiritual and eternal, as far as our welfare is concerned, is in the hands of God. He is the judge of the living and the dead. And that's forever. That's not just for this lifetime. That's eternity. And the last thing I want to mention is that grace teaches us to look for Jesus. He told Titus in Titus 2 and verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus 2, 13. Now nobody in the world knows when the Lord's coming back. Just don't know. What does that mean? Well, it behooves us to be ready at all times. Paul said of, that, of the people of that day, the Christians, that they have turned unto God, and he says, to wait for his Son from heaven. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 Are we waiting? in the way the Bible talks about it. But we cannot be said to be waiting unless we're ready for His coming. And if we do not live soberly, if we do not live righteously, and if we do not live godly, we're just simply not ready for His coming. And therefore, we cannot say, in the way it's used here, that we're waiting for the Lord to come for us to take us home. So there's at least some of the message of Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God hath appeared, bringing salvation to all men, teaching or instructing us to the intent that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly and righteously and godly, in this present world. I started off by saying. In this present world. 
So everything we've studied has to do with this present world. And that's where we are right now. Granted, we're with one heartbeat away from eternity. But the time of probation is now. Will we choose God? Will we die to sin? Will we live holy lives? Will God come first in our thinking and our choices? Will we meet whatever happens in life as the Bible directs us to? And we know it because we study it daily. We meditate on these things day and night. Or do we have our own views of what's what? Now things ought to be. It's awful easy to do that. And sometimes you do it without even realizing that you've decided to do it your way and not God's way. Well, we studied already in the process of looking at these verses what one must believe and do in order to become a Christian. As a child of God, surely we recognize that if we've deviated from the path we've studied this morning, there's a need for repentance, confession of sins, and prayer to God for forgiveness. But here's one more time God's given us to obey the gospel and become a Christian or to be restored to our first love. What will we do with this time? It's up to us, isn't it? If you need to obey the gospel, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.